Now, joining us today, we have Dr. Go Myung Hyun from the Asan Institute for Policy Studies to talk more on these latest developments. Thank you for coming back on the show, uh, Dr. Go. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now, so mm. more details on that letter, that controversial mm. letter sent by Pyongyang to mm. Washington, have uh, reportedly come out. Reuters, citing unnamed officials, said that the tone of the letter mm. basically said that unless the U.S. Mm. has something to offer, don't bother sending uh, Secretary of State Pompeo. Now, we already knew that the letter was quite belligerent in mm. tone that we heard, but uh, this was still quite strong. Does it surprise you at all, uh, considering how things have been going uh, in recent months between North Korea and the U.S.? Well, in a way, it's not surprising in the sense that... It's surprising only in the sense that President Trump has been so much packaging the process as very successful, a very successful one. But in truth, we know from the Secretary Pompeo's last visit to Pyongyang in last July that the dialogue between the two sides has been, I mean, in a way deteriorating, especially because we know in the aftermath that uh, North Korea has issued a statement saying that uh, Secretary Pompeo shouldn't really threaten North Korea like the way like a gangsters do. So we know that uh, you know, probably North Korean letter probably contains some of the response to that incident, and then that is the, probably the response uh, kind of been interpreted as hostile by the United States government this time. Mm. We also heard in that report, reminded mm. in that report, there was another exclusive the mm. other day uh, by Vox News mm. that said Trump promised Kim Jong-un mm. that he would sign a declaration to formally end the Korean War. And the reason why North Korea has mm. been so annoyed lately is because, you know, Trump seems to have reneged on, this, on that promise. How credible do you think that story is? And do you think that it was one of the demands that perhaps was in that letter to uh, uh, Pompeo. So we know that the, even outside the letter, uh, we know that the North Korea has been asking to sign the ceasefire agreement, or actually end declaration of the end of the war agreement uh, with the United States. Uh, they've been very open about that. But then what's surprising about uh, the news story is that President Trump himself has agreed, uh, apparently agreed uh, already back in June, that he signed the agreement. Uh, but then again, we have to understand who President Trump is. Uh, unlike other pre uh, his predecessors, what he says sometimes don't really matter. So it only matters. Where, I mean, if he puts down in writing, mm -hmm. uh, nothing has been, been put down in writing. There's no agreement between the United States and North Korea about <coughs> setting the declaration of the end of the war. So in that sense, there's no roadmap that's agreed upon between the two sides in, when it comes to you know exchanging. I mean, and declaration of the end of the war with some sort of a declaration step by North Korea. So in that sense, without a very clear, explicit roadmap. Uh, signed by the two sides, uh, what President Trump has said uh, probably doesn't really matter. If this, if President Trump really did say that mm. he would promise to mm. uh, end uh, the Korean War formally mm. and, and sign a declaration, isn't that quite dangerous as in a way to, very cavalier mm. anyway, about how he does diplomacy, especially with someone like North Korea, where, you know, uh, mm. it's not just a... Um, uh, some deal. It's the mm. nuclear weapons are on the line here. Well, clearly that's the downside of uh, President Trump's style of diplomacy. He tends to personalize diplomacy. He thinks that he can sit down in a back room with uh, the, the other leader and then have a handshake deal and somehow this deal is going to stick. Uh, yeah, I mean, that just has been the fallacy of his uh, foreign policy, quote-unquote, doctrine. We have seen this with, uh, especially with uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin. So I think he's been making mistake after mistake uh, by engaging this kind of uh, style of diplomacy. But then, uh, I mean, unless he changes uh, his actions, I think we'll keep seeing this happening in the future too. So, but on the other hand, we see a pattern here that the President Trump says something that he doesn't really deliver. Therefore, I mean, I think the opposing side, in this case North Korea, it probably understands too that uh, what President Trump utters in a con private conversation probably doesn't stick anyways. So in that sense, I think uh, there's a more pressure on North Korea to sign an official formal agreement with the U.S. government, not with President Trump. Mm. D I mean, on the other hand, there's, a, there's another argument that could be saying that uh, because of Trump's style, mm. we've got this far in the first place, because, you know, that we're mm. engaging with North mm. Korea, and this kind of engagement mm. hasn't been seen mm. in, in years and decades. Can this situation still be resolved, do you think? And... Uh, how, how do we move, how can, can they move from here? Or does it, do we go back to the kind of high tension, high stakes that, that we saw just uh, last year? So that's exactly the future that President Trump is offering to North Korea. That unless uh, North Korea takes its way, uh, you know, the, the opposite will be 
um, basically going back to the, you know, the time of tension and even uh, of like you know military action. So this is the stark binary kind of future that uh, Trump is threatening to bring to the Korean Peninsula again. But the problem is President Trump right now is engaged in a diplomatic process. And uh, we also know that uh, if North Korean regime doesn't carry out provocations, then it will be very difficult for the U.S. government to mount the level of pressure that we have seen last year. So I think North Korea understands that North Korea has the initiative, despite the fact that North Korea is a weaker player in this case. So whatever Pre President Trump says, uh, it's actually constrained by the fact that we are engaged in a dialogue process right now. So I think that's going to constrain his actions as well. Mm, interesting. Let's move on to a little bit mm. of, to uh, what Trump mm. has said about China. So mm. in a very uh, recent statement to the White House, he declared many things. But he also said that uh, he feels very strongly that North Korea is under tremendous pressure mm. from China. And that we also know that China is providing North Korea with, quote, mm. considerable aid, including money, fuel, fertilizer, and various other commodities. This is not helpful, he says, <laughs> uh, helpfully. Yeah. This is uh, quite a specific list of charges. Do you think it might be fair, though? No, I think it's definitely fair. I think uh, definitely China, even though it's sticking to the, the major parts of the, the United Nations Security Council resolution, uh, sanctions measures against North Korea, uh, probably is turning a blind eye to some of the you know, illegal activities going on along the border, uh, basically smuggling activities. So given the economic size of North Korea, which is very minute compared to China's, even uh, like um, some sort of a uh, 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 like a relaxation on the enforcement against smuggling could help North Korea quite a deal. So, but then on, again, we have to, we, instead of like looking at the list of stuff that the China might be uh, supplying to North Korea, we have to look at the scale of these kind of activities. And I doubt that the scale is big enough uh, as to constitute a major lifesaver for the North Korean economy or like uh, create this uh, source of, uh, you know, like uh, sort of confidence on the part of North Korea to stand up to the U.S. pressure. I don't think the scale is that big. Oh, so you don't think the, what China is promising it right now is a lifeline of, you know, life without UF if, is ne if necessary? I don't think that's the case. We mm. have seen that China doesn't want to confront the United States, especially in the Korean Peninsula, which is uh, basically the, you know, the front step to their most important region, basically to Beijing and Shanghai. So I think that China is uh, trying to manage the tension, while at the same time trying to reconstruct uh, the relationship with North Korea, which has declined a great deal in the last five years. So I think uh, China is trying to get uh, both ways, and, but that means that China is probably constraining itself when it comes to assisting North Korea with economic assistance. Amidst all this, there's also rumors that uh, President, Chinese President Xi Jinping will be going to Pyongyang mm -hmm. for the September 9th uh, anniversary of the, uh, of the North mm. Korean regime's foundation. Mm -hmm. Now, it's only been rumors that hasn't been confirmed by either yeah. side yet, but do you think it could happen? And what would, hap what would it mean if he did go or if he didn't go? So th there are a lot of speculations about it, and it looks like a, a President Xi uh, pro uh, wants to go to Pyongyang one way or another. But then I think uh, there's a danger to, for him to go to uh, North Korea on September 9th. Uh, the problem is uh, if he goes there and then on that date, uh, it's definitely what's going to happen is that he'll be part of the, he'll have to see the, the parade, the military parade that the North Koreans are going to put up. And that parade might include a display of ICBMs and other uh, WMD weapons. And that could come across to the United States as a threatening message, not from North Korea itself, but also from China. Mm -hmm. That China and North Korea are together uh, threatening the United States with ICBMs. So I think that's just something that Chinese leader trying, is trying to avoid right now. So even if he goes to Pyongyang on November, uh, no, uh, September 9th, he'll probably ask the North Korean hosts, host to scale down the parade if President Xi is going to be witnessing the parade. Mm -hmm. If that, uh, that condition is not met, chances that President Xi won't go on the, uh, September 9th, but instead go some, you know, on some other date. Mm -hmm. So that's probably a possibility. Ah, so, so we're not sure yet whether he, you're not sure yet whether he could, he could and could also not go? So, you know, it all depends contingent upon the, the relationship, I mean, the, the level of uh, the progress in being made and the, the dialogue between North Korea and the United States. So if, uh, if the situation deteriorates further, also it's going to decrease the possibility of President Xi going to Pyongyang. Mm. Now, if we turn our attentions to South Korea, mm. who is trying to be interacting with mm. uh, North Korea as well recently, that's gone a bit complicated as mm. well. So uh, one of the recent developments is South Korea has, was meant to carry out field surveys mm. about uh, reconnecting the railways mm. with North Korea. 
But um, South Korea's access was blocked by the UN command, the mm -hmm. forces who are in charge of the uh, border region. Why were they blocked? Well, first of all, um, I think, uh, I think the, uh, on the surface, I think the UN command is uh, sticking to the United Nations Security Council resolutions, uh, especially 2270 and the subsequent ones. And there, it, uh, the UN, United Nations makes it very clear that uh, any type of assistance that inter, uh, in the, in the uh, area of construction and transportation is actually banned. So probably UNC can uh, claim that uh, the survey, uh, field survey uh, research or the trip could be constituting us a, a violation of that ban. So I think that that's actually credible. But on the other hand, I think the UNC also doing this uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know, creating this uh, very uniform perception that uh, you know, everybody, including South Korea, is joining the action to mount pressure on North Korea until North Korea engages in the question steps. So I think uh, the, the motivation is twofold in this case. Of course, it's the United Nations command, mm. but uh, there are some rumors that say it's the US who are unhappy with uh, South Korea trying to do too much engagement too fast with North Korea. Mm. Uh, would you say that could be the case, that they're the ones who've who have tried to maneuver, maneuver it this way? So uh, clearly, well, we call the United Nations Command United Nations, but it's actually headed by a U.S. general. Mm. So in that sense, uh, clearly, uh, the UNC's action reflects what the U.S. administration is thinking in terms of its North Korea policy. So uh, clearly, there's that element in my view. Hmm. Seoul has said, you know, it's trying to, mm. you know, do uh, more interaction mm. with uh, North Korea. And one of the key ones was the uh, setting up of the Joint Liaison mm. Office on the north of the border in the Kaesong area. That's something that they agreed upon mm -hmm. in their last summit. But if this kind of simple field survey to reconnect railways doesn't mm. get through, then what hope is there for opening this Joint Liaison Office? Clearly, uh, I think uh, it's part of the same package. Uh, and I think pro uh, United States government probably views uh, both initiatives on the same level. That it's a one way, uh, it's one on, 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 on a way to bypass uh, the pressure campaign by the United States. So I think it's going to be very difficult for the South Korean government to reopen the liaison office in Kaesong Industrial Complex. But uh, having said that, uh, whereas with the uh, you know, field survey with the trains as an uh, economic as aspect to it, uh, with the liaison office, there, it's actually has a, a diplomatic aspect to it. And right now, everybody agrees in both the United States and South Korea, that we, use, uh, we should work together to increase the level of dialogue with North Korea. So if South Korean government can somehow uh, package this uh, action, I mean, setting up the liaison office in case of, as a diplomatic uh, initiative, then there's some chance that South Korean government might be able to prevail at the end. Mm. Now, uh, if we go back to the report mm. that uh, just before our interview as mm. well, the report also mentioned briefly that the travel ban to North Korea, the U.S. travel mm. ban to North Korea, sorry, has been extended for another year. Mm. Now, travel bans are given to, quote, uh, where there is imminent danger to the public health or mm. physical safety of U.S. travelers in the country or area. Mm. Perhaps this isn't surprising, but even though the Trump administration has been improving relations with the regime, mm. it's to, to have been expected, right? Well, uh, I mean, we know that uh, there's a pattern to U.S. action in the recent days. It's been trying to mount pressure on North Korea by uh, preventing the allies, all the United States itself, from, I mean, individuals from the United States or entities from engaging in economic relations with North Korea. It's been pressuring China by making statements like uh, what you just mentioned from the President Trump Twitter, that China is helping North Korea too much economically, and also preventing South Korean government from conducting this field survey. So we see a pattern here that the United States, again, is trying to isolate North Korea economically. So I think uh, this travel ban should be read in along that, in that trend. So, yeah, no tourism packages to North Korea yet for U.S. citizens. Or the South Korean citizens. Or, the, of course, yeah, the yeah, South Korean yeah. citizens. Well, thank you for coming in today, as usual, and uh, giving us your insights. Ah, it's my pleasure.